Hey guys, it's Danny. Alrighty, today we're gonna play with the mycorrhizae culture that I just purchased in my latest order at Orchids Deluxe. So I have it here. I didn't use it thus far because I did my research and the more I read, the more I actually have some questions. So before we start, I will let you know that I will link you down below to the articles that I found most interesting. I also found a video with a lecture. You will see everything down below. And if you wanna get yourself familiar first with mycorrhizae you can pause this video read a little bit about it I will make a small presentation of what they are as well and then we're gonna go to the experiment let's start with the subject of mycorrhizae very very fast what they are why are they important to plants in general and do we actually need them Alrighty, so mycorrhizae is a name given to a group of fungus which are actually not detrimental to plants. There are many types of fungi in the world and of course in our growing collections. The most prevailing type of fungus that we orchid growers encounter is the saprophytic fungus which actually feeds on dead and decaying matter such as the little webs that you find on really broken down medium sometimes. These are actually fungi feeding on the decaying matter. It is your cue to actually change organic matter because it is decomposing, it is becoming very, very acidic and it can harbor more pathogens than before. So I think we've all seen that type of fungus. That type of fungus doesn't really affect our orchid directly because it feeds on already decaying matter, but it is a cue for us to change the medium in the case of organic medium. Another type of fungus that we can encounter is the parasitic fungus, which feeds on live things. And sadly, the most delicious thing on their menu when it comes to orchids is their root tips. On the screen you'll have a few pictures that I took of one of my orchids with a growing root tip which was attacked by this fungus. You can see it's a little bit fuzzy it was very much alive the previous day. So in one day the fungus actually attacked the root, it managed to destroy it, and that is why we call them parasitic fungi, because they colonize live portions of the roots. And of course you can find the fungal infections, rots and so on that take over healthy plants, those are parasitic in nature as well and they're very very common with orchids. So overall we do have this impression that fungi usually spells trouble when it comes to the orchid world and it usually does. But there is another group of fungi which are actually not that bad, and these are the mycorrhizae. What they do is they actually don't kill off their host, they don't prey on decaying matter. What they do is tap or inoculate the plants or orchids roots, and typically they form their own network which spreads through the soil, starting from the root system of a plant. It doesn't sound very friendly, does it? Well, the fungi actually provides nutrients to the plant, specifically nitrogen and phosphorus. Plus, it would appear that it actually has more benefits than that. It could actually limit infection with other pathogenic type of fungi or other disease. And in return, the plant gives it carbohydrates or sugars, since the fungi cannot really photosynthesize. So in this case, even though the fungi inoculates the orchid, it taps into the root system, it doesn't actually kill the root system. It forms this bond or collaboration with the plants. I will have to warn you from the start that most research has been done on trees or shrubs and crops, not necessarily orchids, but as far as I understand, researchers are actually working a little bit on orchid mycorrhizae as well, since a great deal of orchids do depend on mycorrhizae at one stage of their life at least, and this is when they're very young, when they're seeds, seedlings before they reach maturity. You know how orchid seeds cannot actually be sprouted in the normal environment of your home if you sprinkle them on soil or anything they're actually not gonna grow? Well this is because they depend on the very same fungi, the mycorrhizae. These mycorrhizae are responsible with feeding the seedlings and helping them until they reach maturity. Orchid seeds are very fine, they're not protected by a shell and they don't have any nutrients at their disposal in the early stages. That's where the fungus comes in. The problem is the fungus can only form bonds and can only exist in the presence of roots. 
So seeds would have to land theoretically around roots colonized by the mycorrhizae as well. We cannot put the mycorrhizae in the seeds and poof we have an orchid. It doesn't really work like that, in appearance at least as far as I read. But we are sure at this point that orchids do benefit from this collaboration with mycorrhizae, which by the way is a group of fungi, it's not just one, it's quite a diverse group and many mycorrhizae are specific to the type of plant they colonize. Trees will have different strains of mycorrhizae, orchids, again, different strains and so on. The question that scientists are trying to explain at the moment, and a very big question that I have as well, is if this relationship is kept throughout the orchid's life. Because there are a few problematic issues, such as Epiphytic orchids do not grow in high moisture conditions necessarily. And I'm not gonna talk here about the cloud forest orchids, let's take for example your typical cattleya, orchids that grow in pretty harsh environments when it comes to water. Their roots spread along the trees, they're not in the soil. Also, at maturity, orchids are very, very specialized at utilizing nutrients, at being very economic with them, and so on. They don't at least appear to still maintain that relationship between them and the fungi. So is the fungus actually helpful for orchids once they reach maturity? Well, I think that's a million dollar question that some people say yes, they do still benefit from the relationship. Some people say no, they don't. In the end, I'm not a scientist, I don't know. I would like to know, but the truth is, the product, the mycorrhizae uh, mycelium, is on the market and people in the industry actually use it. Some farmers use it and also some people who grow cannabis. And there is actually a very nice article down below related to this. But see, all of these plants are terrestrial. All of the root system is terrestrial as well. It's not epiphytic, doesn't grow on trees in very drought-prone environments. They're different. So how come we can find this little thing on the market? Well, why not take the opportunity to make some extra money, right? This was purchased from a website dedicated to orchids. It's not a hydroponic website, not one that sells trees or uh, cannabis or anything of the sorts. It's just an orchid site. There is a possibility that the whole mycorrhizae situation related to mature orchids is pretty much hype. But there is a chance that it's not. So that's what we're gonna test today with a few divisions of one of my orchids. Also, I wanna see how the root system looks like. If you check the lecture down below, the video lecture, you will see that these fungi determine a physiological change within the root system of a plant. They determine stubbier but thicker roots rather than long spindly roots. Anyway, I am curious to see if we will see any physiological changes within the root system of the orchids. I'm not entirely sure if we're gonna see the mycelium or something of the fungi. As far as I know, and I cannot really tell you how I know this, it might not be true, so take it with a grain of salt. I think I read somewhere that the orchid mycorrhizae doesn't have a fruiting body in the sense that you will not have a uh, mushroom appearing in the medium and that's the mycorrhizae. I'm not even sure if we're gonna see the network of the fungus, but that is for us to discover. Bottom line, there is a slight chance this is just useless for the orchids we grow. There is a chance that it might actually help, but there is definitely a chance that this stuff actually helps terrestrial plants. So I'll leave it at that. And now let's get on to the experiment. I'm gonna show you what I plan to do. Okay, so I asked for some directions from Orchids Deluxe and they told me a teaspoon per plant should be okay. And well, this is a tiny plant. I'm not sure if I'm gonna put exactly a teaspoon, but I'm going to put about five milliliters. And the first one we are going to pot is going to be the bark one. I got myself bark mix here, bark medium. Not sure how good it is, but it's bark. Okay, so the important thing is that we place the mycorrhizae culture directly on the roots or in the presence of roots. I just want to make sure I am placing the mycorrhizae on the root system, therefore I shall arrange my orchid like so. Okay, here we have it. I'm going to go and water this 
A little side note, I will be using filtered water, osmosis water. I did a bit of research, apparently tap water doesn't have enough chlorine to do any damage to the fungus, but just to be sure that I don't pose any threat, I am going to be using osmosis water. And PS2, this brand of bark is not half bad, it actually smells good and looks good. So here we go, it's called Flora Bella. If you have it in your country and you're on the lookout for some good bark, this is quite good. Keep in mind, it's geared more towards water lovers because it does have that cocoa fiber. So I'm not entirely sure I would use this with cattleyas and stuff that need to drain well, but with oncidiums, I think it's okay. With terrestrials, I think it's okay. Paphiopetalums. So there you have it. I'm going to water this now. Next up, the sphagnumoss experiment. I will use a little bit of perlite as well just to make things a little bit more well draining. Now here's the deal. Sphagnumoss brags that it has antifungal properties. So if that is true, theoretically it should not be a good medium for mycorrhizae. Well, we're gonna test that. If the mycorrhizae develop, then uh, we're gonna draw some conclusions. If it doesn't develop, but in the other ones it develops, then we're gonna draw some different conclusions. You know what I mean? It's a complex experiment. Okay, this one is done too. I will be giving it a good watering and I'll come back for the leka. Leka will stay quite a lot more airy than the other materials, I suspect. And there are also big air pockets, so I'm gonna try not to lose all of this material. It started to run off from the other pots as well, so no flushing, no watering on top of the sink or anything, because all of the colony is just going down the train. So this is the Leka pot ready as well. I'm going to water it very gently because of the air pockets. And this one is the control group. I will not be putting any mycorrhizae in this pot. I don't know where my marker is, so I put a little wire here. All of these orchids will be kept in the very same location, watered with the very same uh, water. And I'm curious to see if we will see any differences in the treated orchids and the non-treated orchid. And here we have the orchids. You can see in the tray that the pieces of that medium, the mycorrhizae medium, let's call it like that, are in the tray. So yes, I will be careful, no flushing, no watering at the sink, I will water from the top and just let water pull a little bit on the tray. In my environment, it's really no issue. So these are the orchids, the sphagnum one, the bark, uh, semi-hydro, whatever, and the control group. So I'm really curious to see how all of these will develop it takes about a month for the mycorrhizae to inoculate the orchid and start to develop, at least this is what I read. So within a month, we might be able to make an update. Now, I tried to make this as fair as possible. I tried not to use different orchids, but of course, with these divisions, some will probably take off a little bit more than others. So after a month, I don't think it's very relevant to see the growth rate, but I do want to see if there is any change in roots or at the root level at least to be fully honest i don't know what to expect but if anything happens of course i will film it so there we have it bottom line conclusions i don't know you guys i'm not the type of person who just goes by the hype and why did this michael risey thing take off well, I saw it in the comments. Two years ago, nobody talked about it. Something happened. There were a few studies, a few discoveries that talked about them. We managed to learn what they do for terrestrial plants, for trees, for crops. And then, of course, it seeped into the orchid world. But as I was saying, there are many mysteries when it comes to orchids, epiphytic orchids, that is. I'm not gonna talk about the terrestrial orchids necessarily or lithophytes. But the epiphytic orchids, they are a mystery when it comes to mycorrhizae and the fact that now everybody talks about them. Uh, you know how it is, hype. But does it really work? I don't know. Hoping to find out if there is something which can limit stress, transplant shock, uh, protect from pathogens such as Fusarium. There is an article who suggests that. You know, I'm more than happy to use them and I'm happy I found them. But at the same time, you know me, I'm not the type of person who gets excited without real reasons. And right now, I don't really have a real reason. Fingers crossed that in the long run, we're gonna see differences. Alrighty guys, thank you so much for watching. A little heads up, you know the problem that I told you about with my boyfriend? Well, we will actually go to see doctors and so on, so I'll try my best to post regularly, but there will be days when I will not upload any video. Don't worry, but yeah, just letting you guys know that my schedule might be a little hectic the following days. 
So you know the drill, if you've enjoyed this video give it a thumbs up, if you hated it give it a thumbs down, subscribe to my channel for regular orchid videos and don't forget to turn on notifications so you never miss a video. And with that said, I'll see you all next time, bye!